Run away. So, now we are welcoming another celebrity of Mozilla, uh, a great, great member of the Mozilla community, William, but he's most known as Fuzzy Fox. Um, so Fuzzy Fox works at the Mozilla Foundation on WebMaker. Um, a part of his job is dealing with designing for participation and web literacy. So he's going to talk to you about that. Um, he is also a Mozilla community volunteer from the United Kingdom. Um, and tonight, tonight, you may find William in a karaoke <laughs> because it's another of his specialties and believe in me, he has just a fantastic voice. So please welcome William. Okay, so apparently the, the clip-on mic not working. Never mind. So uh, I'm Will, as Clarissa mentioned, and I work for the foundation mostly around web literacy and web maker stuff. Um, so this is me. Uh, my IRC handle is Fuzzy Fox, but that's the weirdest looking fox I've ever seen in the world. So not sure where that comes from. Um, but anyway, let's go through this nice and quick. Because uh, there's a whole bunch of interactive things here. So you aren't all just going to be doing whatever you want at your computer screens the whole time. I'm going to force you to engage with other people. I'm going to force you here to actually go and make a connection with someone, whether you like it or not. So just a heads up, those of you who have got laptops out, in about two, three minutes, you're going to want to have those things off the desks for their safety. So, as I mentioned, I work for these guys. You probably know them because of this thing, but I work on this thing. So, Mozilla is built on four pillars of activity, which are, when the slide finishes moving, build, empower, teach, and shape. Now, fine, that's Mozilla's pillars of activity. What has this got to do with participation? Well, Mozilla exists because of participation. And through all of the papers that I've been reading over the past few months before doing this talk, you can start to spot these things occurring everywhere. And these don't just occur within Mozilla. These kinds of activities also appear within the Ubuntu community, within Linux, within almost every open source community in the world. So why are they so important? And, and what is this participation thing that I keep mentioning? Because participation is a word that some people don't grasp straight away. You may think you're participating with people, and you may think you are making it easy for people to participate, but you might not. So Henry Jenkins, who is a professor at, UC, at USC, said this in the middle of one of the papers, and it just kind of stood out to me. Participatory, blah, 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 language fail. Participatory culture shifts the focus of literacy from one, individu one of individual expression to community involvement. So participatory culture is embedded in the roots of open source culture. You can't have one without the other. So let's, let's do a quick demonstration of that. Open source culture works because we try and make it easy for other people to reproduce things and do their own thing with the same code base. So let's do a physical demonstration. Okay? I'm going to have to let the mic go, so I'm going to shout at you. So my apologies for shouting at you. I don't want to be mean, but technology... So what I want you to do is I want you to follow along. And I'm going to try and force you to get this wrong. OK? So arms out, thumbs down. Cross one arm over the other. Open your fingers. And grab, make a fist. OK, wiggle your thumbs. Wiggle your fingers. Thumbs, little fingers. In the back, little fingers. Thumbs, little fingers. Thumbs. And then all you have to do, little fingers, Thumbs, little fingers, keep going, keep going. All you have to do is twist like that. <laughs> uh, 
So that's an example of not designing for participation while designing for participation. I got you all to get involved, but you all got it wrong. Now why? Well, I didn't tell you exactly what I was doing. I showed you, but you weren't looking for it because I wasn't explicitly saying, hey, there's this step that I'm not going to tell you about, but you have to do it. So I'm not going to tell you that step right now. I'll let you try and work it out, and if you want to know the answer later, come and find me. But what we're going to do this time is do another example, but this time it's designing for participation that goes well and it acts exactly as it's supposed to. Who's heard of Thumb War? A couple of people. You know, where you get your thumbs and you, you waggle them like this. And you have two people. You have one person and another person. And you try and keep their thumb down for five seconds. And the person whose thumb is on top wins. Now, there's a, there's, a, there's a mass engaged version of this called, well, Massive Multiplayer Thumb War. <laughs> and this, this will invoke a number of emotions all at the same time. Confusion, excitement, anger. Uh, hopefully not violence. Um, but <laughs> what we're going to do, we're going to try and have a go at this. So I like just a couple of people who are kind of at the edges down here. I'm going to pick on you guys because you're at the edge and you're close. If you can come up... And we're going to try and recreate that so you guys can see how the hands fit together. And then what I want you to do is I want you to reach out to as many different people that you can physically reach, even if you have to stretch across seats. And we're going to have a giant game. And the winners are going to be the people that win the thumb war with both hands. <laughs> so, oh yeah, sorry, I, I forgot to mention. We have two hands, so we can play two at the time. Uh, the other thing is it doesn't have to just be a unit of four. It can be a unit of as many people as you like, because we know these things called networks, right? And you have clusters in them, and, well, we've got a couple of groups here, so there's going to be a big one here, no doubt. There's probably going to be a big one up towards the back there, and there's going to be a couple of kind of people like that <laughs> stuck in the middle. But let's just try and get this hand gesture down. So in the photo, you can see all four hands revolving around each other. So stick your fingers out straight, always with the same hand, so everyone right-handed, and then close them up. Okay, and then you get a thumb, thumb war. So the thumb war historically only starts when someone counts, di counts it in, okay? And that, let's, let's not have me do that, because I'm going to talk to you a lot otherwise, so. Three, two, one, go. <laughs> and that's cheating. And this can go on for a while. So before someone breaks something up here, laptops, put them somewhere safe. Don't just leave them on the table to get knocked off. But I now want you to turn to as many people as you can. You have two hands. Stretch out and have a go. This time, I have told you every possible step. So if you lose, it's just because you're bad. I want to see a connection from this group at the front all the way up to the back. You aren't getting away with it because you're all the way back there. No one start yet. It hasn't had the countdown. I've seen nodes of up to 10 hands together. Terrifying but possible. If there's an end that doesn't connect to anything, just waggle it around furiously, but you won't win with it. <laughs> okay, everyone ready? I'm going to give you a minute, okay? You have one minute to beat everyone else in your thumb war. And remember, you've got two hands, so try and focus on both at the same time. It might help. Okay, on the count of three, two, one... Thumb war. As soon as you win, the hand you win with, shove it in the air. And that spare hand doesn't count still. Oh. <laughs>
If you've won with a hand, if you win with your right hand, stick your right hand in the air. If you win with your left hand, stick your left hand in the air. If you win with both, do the awkward giraffe. And time's up. If you won with your right hand, put your right hand in the air. If you've won with your left hand, stick your left hand in the air. If you won with both, do the awkward giraffe. Woo! Okay, so here we've actually learned a couple of things at the same time. I haven't explained it to you guys explicitly, which is wrong. But I'm going to do that now. We're all from kind of the techie scene, techie world here, whether we're coders or we just write about this stuff or we just like to make people look stupid like I do. What we've actually engaged in here is not only connecting with people one-to-one -one and starting to get a little bit of an idea about who they are. You can kind of tell if someone's going to cheat that they're not the sort of person you want to let play the game with you again. But we've also started to learn about networks. So we can use physical activities to explain digital things. So a network is, as we know, a node with another node and another node connected somehow. Now we did that using our bodies and arms. And that's just one piece of digital literacy. And digital literacies, there's a lot of them. There's not one single digital literacy. There's a whole bunch from hardware to electronics to coding to binary to... You name it, it exists. Web literacy is just one of these digital literacies. And that's the other thing that I work on. And that's the other thing in the title of this talk. So what is web literacy? How do we do some kind of demonstration of that? Because the web is code. It runs in the browser. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try. But I'm going to try and at the same time start to demonstrate a point that I'm going to make in a bit. So there's this group called Hyper Island. And they, do these, um, they have this entire Bible called the Energizer Bible. And Energizer is a bit of jargon, so let's explain that jargon. Because it, it could mean a number of things. It doesn't mean batteries or the Energizer Bunny. Like, they're not connected to this. But an Energizer is an energy booster. Okay? So sitting in here all day, like that, reasonably low energy. Thumb war, doing the awkward giraffe, they use up energy, and they also raise your energy levels because you have to start using some. Your body goes, I might need more, and throws it into your system. So you can read. I'm not going to read that all to you. These slides will be online later, so you can look them up later if you want. But we're going to play the shouting game. So this room's been fairly quiet. We've made a bit of noise now. Let's make a lot of noise. And I won't shout into the microphone, I promise. But... The way we're going to play this is the shouting game is very simple in principle. Everyone starts shouting as loud as they can for two minutes. That's it. That's the whole game. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hack on this. So something that, we, you've, <laughs> something that you've heard in a, several of the presentations before me and you may hear in some of the presentations after is this word remix. Remix is embedded within this... Blah, 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 blah. I can't do my own language today. Remix is embedded within participatory culture, right? It's taking an idea, making a change, and then running with it. So the change I'm making is I don't want you to shout random things, because that's what the game requires, just anything, just noise. I want you to start listing as many web-related things as you can, as loud as you can, for two minutes. So HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Start listing properties if you run out of ideas. Start listing like, things like closures. This particular program, if it's related to the web, shout it. So, who's, who, who's, who's got a big voice? Who, who thinks they're going to be heard over this noise? This guy. Right, I'll, I'll stand further away from him, then. So, on the count of three, I want you to as loud as you can, okay? I want them to hear us in K-building. I want you to shout as many different things about CSS as you can. And I'm going to shorten this down to a minute again. So, it might help if you stand up. It might not. I'll leave it to you, but there is a little known fact, but it's scientifically proven that when you stand up, you get a bit more space for your diaphragm, you can make a louder noise. And loud noises are fun. So, 
On the count of three, start listing as many things as you can, as loud as you can. Three, two, one. All together. Is that all you've got? Keep going. What do sausages have to do with the web? <laughs> okay, so that's enough shouting. I think we've definitely terrified anyone wanting to come into this room. So, well done. Um, we might have to go and say it's okay, it's okay, we're not going to kill you when you come in. Uh, I, I don't know, sausages guy might, but wh whatever. So how does this tie to web literacy? Well, you all said a lot of different things, and they're all to do with the web. And web literacy is the understanding of things on the web, or things how the web works, and so on and so forth. But trying to pick out the individual words you're saying at the same time as each other, while shouting it, while trying to get your one point across, is incredibly hard. I only heard sausages because he waited till the end. I only heard CSS because he waited till the end, and everyone else had shut up. But that's not how the web works. The web is continual content, continual voices going out and trying to get heard. And that's good. That's what it should be. But there needs to be a way for people that don't understand these things to map this out, to try and work out what's kind of key to knowing how the web works. And then from there, they can move on and start shouting themselves. We can start to make a louder noise. We can start to have a bigger impact. So. This is the web literacy map. I'm not going to go into detail. It's something that was created by Mozilla to try and map out what you need to know to be web literate. You've got columns, which are strands, and they relate to three things, exploring, building, and connecting. And within those, you've got things like navigation, search, privacy. I don't know if you can see that on this screen. I can't. Uh, so go and look this up. But this is a good way to map things out that look like this. If we had all of you everything you said in a big list, we'd end up with something like that. And this is just Bugzilla. I chose this because a lot of you are coders, a lot of you have seen a tool like this, I'm trying to engage. Maybe not well, but I'm trying. And this, this is hard. Um, for someone who's brand new, trying to get involved with something like this, it's kind of terrifying. You've got these things here that mean something, and email addresses, lots of them. And what, what, what's going on here? What's a SOP? Uh, yeah. There are better ways to do it for the new people, right? Us coders, we love this stuff. This is fine for us. For someone trying to get into this area, for someone trying to become web literate or just digitally, blah, blah, digitally literate or just get involved, terrifying. You're going to hate me in a second. There we go. So Josh Matthews, created this wonderful tool, which kind of digests it down a bit. Well, I say a bit, a lot, but it does it in a good way. It's really simple. The call to action is really clear. Like, what's your favorite programming language? We can all answer that question. New people, maybe not as much, but if they've had a little bit, co bit of coding experience, they probably have a bit of an opinion there. We're all very good at having opinions. And then it says, tell me more, boring. Well. I click to tell me more, because I know a bit of JavaScript, I kind of like it. So I get to see, oh look, there's this, this thing that I can get involved with. And from here I can go and explore that more, I can say, nah, I don't like that. Or I can say, oh, I don't like JavaScript anymore, what the hell is that? It's terrifying, look at it, it's ugly, it's like you. He's completely oblivious, it's okay, I do know him. <laughs> so this is a graph you'll see a lot when it comes to contribution. You've got, this is, is time contributed. So a lot of you guys are probably in this area. So you know how to talk to these people. These guys can look after themselves. You don't have to try and engage with these people as, with as much gusto. You don't have to try and dumb things down, which you don't have to do for anyone, but I'll get onto that. But these guys, they know Bugzilla 
or they know GitHub issues. They like looking at it because they understand how it works. These guys are literate. Then you've got the people who are slightly less literate. And we, we, we're kind of good at dealing with those people. We're, we're kind of okay. And when a new coder comes up, you might have a bit of a, this question again? Well, th th at least you answer the questions. We're, we're okay. Then, then there's this entire orange section down the bottom. We're very bad at helping these people. Like, everyone is very bad at this. Even if you try to do it, you're very bad at it. But this, this curve is not a problem. This is what you should see. The problem is if this is really steep. If this is a really steep curve and you only have a couple of people who are literate, the guys down this end are never going to have a freaking clue what you're talking about. They aren't going to know what you mean when you start talking about C compilers. They're just going to look at you and go, uh-huh, 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 uh, yeah, there's nothing even line. But, eh. so what you want to do is try and get a shallower curve. And a shallower curve is fairly easy to achieve. It doesn't mean dumbing things down. It means removing jargon, right? I had the Energizer slide up, and it had a word, a piece of jargon in there, which you now know. You now know what Energizer means. Because I put an explanation. I explained what that piece of jargon meant. This is simply a good way to go, hey, we do a lot of things. What are you interested in? So you ask the question. You try and work out stuff to work out where you can best put them in terms of this is an area of the community you may be interested in getting involved in. That starts to shallow that curve out because you start to go onto their playing field. They start, you start to move people from the bottom end of that curve into the middle. And once they're in the middle, it's easier to move them up to the end. And the curve starts to shallow itself out automatically. You don't have to do much work to make that happen. 30 seconds is enough. I mean, how long does it take to write a new thing for this, like a new question? 30 seconds. See? So this is good. This is also good. This is good for people at the end. This is good for people at the top. And we don't need to be afraid of the people at the end. What we need to be is considerate and understanding that they don't understand all of the technical terms we're using all the time. They might have a good grasp of basic web development, for example. Like, they have an okay grasp of making a web page. It looks kind of okay, and it does something useful. But when you start throwing terms at them that they've never heard before, that's not going to help. That's going to push them back out to the other end. What you want to do is, when you throw one of those terms at them, if you get a look back, then you need to start explaining things. Okay? And you don't have to dumb it down. Just start going, well, this one word could be explained by five words without losing any meaning or context. Use the five words. So there's a brilliant African proverb that says, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. That doesn't mean that your project has to go slow. We've already solved for that with open source. We have this thing. It's called Git. It's wonderful. Version control in general. It allows people to take the bits that they want to work on, do it quickly at their own pace, and then send it back. But the people that are doing the slower stuff, they can go at a slower pace without having any real impact on their learning or their understanding. So Mark Simon, who is the executive director of the Mozilla Foundation, uh, said this. And it's a quote that I've used in numerous different presentations, but it has a, a resonating piece in it, which is that the power of the web is the idea anyone can make. So anyone, anyone, including the people at the bottom of the graph down there, they can make anything for the web, right? We all need to be web makers. And that doesn't just mean we all need to make things for the web. It means we need to help other people make things for the web as well. And this applies to things like C compilers. This applies to everything. I'm just sticking with the li web literacy stuff because that's what I know. And hopefully you now know a little bit more about that, as well as a little bit more about how to design for participation. So I'm going to have like one more slide for you. And it's equation. And I did steal this slide. But I, I, I mentioned who it was at the bottom. And there's a link so you can go and watch the entire talk. It's on TED. It's really, it's really worth the watch. Especially if you like women saying, talk nerdy to me. That, that's in there a lot. But it's, it's pretty simple. 
take your science, which is your code and whatever, remove bullet points and jargon, because looking at bullet points on slides and on web pages, unless they're short and concise, horrible. Divide by relevance, and that means only give the information that's useful. Okay, so remove anything that isn't relevant. Times it by your passion. You're sat in a room in the middle of Brussels, coming from goodness knows how far away because you're passionate about your project. Represent that in your explanations. And that will equal better understanding. And better understanding means better participation. And that means moving people from the bottom of the curve towards the top of the curve and shallowing it out. So, questions? I got. Five minutes, Max? Yes! Someone get a microphone to him before he starts asking me things and no one else can hear. Because that wouldn't be good for participation. That's a hard word to say sometimes. In the, uh, in the slide we just saw, where did you divide by relevance? I divide by relevance. I... I divide by relevance because that's what's in the original slide. I think a better thing to have in there would be divide by non-relevance. So get rid of the stuff that isn't relevant to the conversation. So if you're trying to talk about a closure, for example, in JavaScript, don't start going on and how you can use these things like for the really crazy stuff on the cutting edge before you've explained what it actually does. Do the explaining first. Do the relevant stuff first. You can get onto the other stuff later. It can wait. Any others? No? Okay, I'm going to be floating around in here for uh, at least another two talks. So you can come find me. Oh, yeah. Uh, can we get a microphone down here? Run, Ziggy, run! Yeah, I, I start my question right now. Uh, I didn't get the message of your graph, the one with the three colors, and I'd really like to get it. Um, to me, it looks like a contradiction in itself. So what I Wrong way around. So you've got the number of contributors here. So this is like thousands and millions of people. And then you've got the amount of time they're contributing. The people that are contributing a lot of time will typically, now there are caveats, but will typically have a good understanding already. Because if you don't have an understanding of something, you've still got to be a very determined person to keep trying to do that. And the, the general rule is people aren't, don't have that patience. Anyone else? No? Okay. So, if I run through these as quickly as I can, there is a slide at the back for you. Oh, come on, move quicker. So, you can get in touch with me at the email address at the bottom. Uh, yeah, and I'm out of here. You have two minutes to sing us a song if you want. No. No? Okay. okay. <laughs> we could always play another game. <laughs>